Now's the time when we pull out all of the scary movies in our collections and pile them up in preparation for the Halloween Horror Movie Marathon. But before you grab the popcorn and dim the lights, bone up on your horror knowledge with these 40 facts about some of your favorite scary movies. 1. Count Orlock only blinks once in Nosferatu. In the nine minutes of screen time Max Shrek has his Count Orlock in F.W. Murnau's classic Nosferatu 1922, he blinks only one time near the end of Part 1, 2. The Exorcist was the first horror film to be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar. The horror genre has never gotten much love from the Academy. Though there still seems to be a bias against scary movies during award season, The Exorcist earned 10 Oscar nominations in 1974, including a Best Supporting Actress nod for Linda Blair, who was just 15 years old at the time. 3. Robert Englund was not the first choice to play Freddy Krueger. Wes Craven reportedly planned to have a stuntman play the seemingly immortal youth outer known as Freddy Krueger, but wisely opted to go with an accomplished actor for the role instead. His first choice was the brilliant British character actor David Warner, who you'll no doubt recognize from Time Bandits, Titanic, and various incarnations of Star Trek. Warner had to pass on the project, which opened the door for the truly excellent Robert Englund. 4. Psycho is the first American film to feature a toilet. Psycho is the first American film to show a toilet on screen. It's also the first American film in which we hear a toilet being flushed. That's just how repressed Americans were in the 1950s. 5. Stephen King WASNTA Fan of The Shining In 1983, Stephen King told Playboy, I'd admired Stanley Kubrick for a long time and had great expectations for the project, but I was deeply disappointed in the end result. Parts of the film are chilling, charged with the relentlessly claustrophobic terror, but others fell flat. King D.I.D.N.T. liked the casting of Jack Nicholson either, claiming, Jack Nicholson, though a fine actor, was all wrong for the part. His last big role had been in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and between that and the manic grin, the audience automatically identified him as a loony from the first scene. But the book is about Jack Torrance's gradual descent into madness through the malign influence of the Overlook. If the guy is nuts to begin with, then the entire tragedy of his downfall is wasted. 6. Jaws D.O.E.S.N.T. fully appear in a shot until 1 hour and 21 minutes into the movie. While the lack of shark appearances works to heighten the tension in Jaws, the real reason the shark I.S.N.T. shown in full is because the mechanical shark that was built rarely worked during filming. Director Steven Spielberg had to create inventive ways like Quint's yellow barrels to shoot around the non-functional movie shark. 7. Fay Ray thought she'd be starring opposite Cary Grant in King Kang. In his attempts to entice Fay Ray into starring in King Kong 1933, director Marion C. Cooper promised, you're going to have the tallest, darkest leading man in Hollywood. While my thoughts were flying toward the hope that Cooper might be waiting for Cara's grand arrival just as I was, Cooper went on to point at the giant ape and say, again, the tallest, darkest leading man in Hollywood, recalled Ray. 8. IT took seven years to get aliens made. Why did it take seven years to get a sequel made lawyers and money, of course. Talk of a sequel began shortly after the original Alien 1979 was hit, but it was delayed because of a dispute between the film's producers and 20th Century Fox over the distribution of the original movie's profits. Fox, reluctant to make a sequel because it would be expensive, finally agreed to it as a way of settling the beef with the producers. Basically, we won't give you any more of the first movie's profits, but we'll greenlight a sequel, and you can make money from that. Amusingly, the same producers plus James Cameron and Gail Ann Hurd sued Fox again after Aliens, claiming the studio had used creative accounting techniques to avoid paying them. 9. Brian De Palma DIDNTC Sissy Spacek as Carrie Though Brian De Palma was a fan of Sissy Spacek's work, he was convinced that he had already found his Carrie in another actress. His decision to let Spacek audition at all was mostly out of courtesy to her husband, Jack Fisk, the film's art director. He told me that if I wanted to, I could try out for the part of Carrie White, Spacek recounted to Rolling Stone. There was another girl that he was set on and unless he was really surprised, she was the one. I hung up and decided to go for it. Spacek showed up at her audition in an old dress she hadn't worn since grade school and with her hair slicked back with Vaseline. When she was done, she waited in the parking lot while her husband reviewed her audition with the rest of the production team. After Fisk came out to tell her that the part was hers, we sped off before anybody could change his mind, Spacek said. 10. Roman Polanski and John Cassavetes had different ideas for R.O.S.E.M.A.R.Y.S. Baby. 
In her 1997 autobiography, What Falls Away, Mia Farrow recounted the tense relationship between Roman Polanski and her Rosemary's Baby co-star, writing that, in the film's climactic scene, John became openly critical of Roman, who yelled, John, shut up and they move toward each other, and nearly came to blows. Apparently, it was Ruth Gordon and her consummate professionalism that calmed the situation down. 11. In 2015, George Romero found nine minutes of lost footage from Night of the Living Dead. While in Maryland for Monster Mania Con this year, George Romeo shared that he recently unearthed a 16mm workprint of Night of the Living Dead, which features approximately nine minutes of previously thought of the lost footage at the jump cut in the basement, including the largest zombie scene in the film, 12. Serial killer Ed Gain inspired three major horror movies. You've likely heard of Ed Gain. His house of horrors made headlines for years after he was sent to a mental hospital for his actions. They were so memorable, in fact, that he inspired some of the most iconic thrillers of all time Psycho, The Silence of the Lambs, and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Among the items discovered at his Plainfield, Wisconsin farm were four noses, nine masks made of human skin, numerous decapitated heads, lampshades and bowls made of skin, lips being used as a pull on a window shade, and a belt made from nipples. Gain later admitted to only two murders and said most of the items had come from late-night cemetery raids, 13. The Halloween script DID and T call for a specific kind of mask. The mask from Michael Myers was only described as having the pale, neutral features of a man, and for the movie the design was boiled down to two options, both were cheap latex masks painted white and bought for under $2 a piece at local toy stores by production designer Tommy Lee Wallace. One was a replica mask of a clown character called Weary Willy popularized by actor Emmett Kelly, and the other was a stretched-out Captain Kirk mask from Star Trek. Carpenter chose the whitewashed Kirk mask because of its eerily blank stare that fit perfectly with the Myers character, 14. The B-A-B-A-D-O-O-K scared the hell out of William Friedkin. On November 30, 2014, Jennifer Kent's The Babadook got a major publicity boost when The Exorcist director William Friedkin tweeted I've never seen a more terrifying film than The Babadook. It will scare the hell out of you as it at me, 15. A double amputee was used to create the thing's quintessential special effect. One of the most memorable scenes in John Carpenter's The Thing often referred to as the chest chomp occurs when Dr. Copper Richard Dizzard attempts to revive Norris Charles Hallahan with a defibrillator. As he presses the paddles to his patient's skin, Norris' chest opens up and Copper's forearms disappear into the cavity, where they are severed below the elbow by a set of jaws inside Norris' chest. In order to pull this off, special makeup effects designer Rob Bodden known for his work on Robocop, Total Recall, Say 7 and, and Fight Club found a man who had lost both of his arms below the elbow in an industrial accident. Bodden fit the man with two prosthetic forearms consisting of wax bones, rubber veins, and jello. Then, for the wide-angle shot, he fit the man with a skin-like mask taken from a mold of Dissert's face a la Hannibal Lecter and placed the Urzat's arms into the chest cavity, where a set of mechanical jaws clamped down on them. As the actor pulled his arms away, the jello arms severed below the elbows. The rest is practical effects history, 16. The original ending of Fright Night was much different. The film's original ending saw Peter Vincent transform into a vampire, while hosting Fright Night in front of a live television audience, 17. The stars of The Blair Witch Project used GPS trackers to find their instructions for the day. Production programmed waypoints in the GPS unit for the actors to locate milk crates with three little plastic canisters in them. Each plastic canister contained notes on where the story was going for each actor, who would not show the other to their paper. From that point they were free to improvise the dialogue, provided they followed the general instructions given to them. 18. Paranormal Activity is the most profitable film of all time. Often compared to The Blair Witch Project because of its low-budget nature and huge grosses, 10 years after The Blair Witch Project's release, the original Paranormal Activity ousted the earlier horror film as the most profitable movie, based on return on investment Roy. The Blair Witch Project cost about $60,000 to make whereas Paranormal Activity's initial budget was just $15,000. Blair Witch grossed $248.6 million worldwide, which comes out to a 414,233% return on investment. After grossing $65 million, it was calculated that Paranormal Activity made a 433,900% ROI. Of course that doesn't factor in its final worldwide gross of $193 million which, if you do the math on that total, works out to a 1,286,566% ROI, 19. 
Scream was originally titled Scary Movie. The original title of the film was Scary Movie, but it was changed to Scream by the Weinstein brothers in the middle of production. They allegedly decided on the change because Harvey Weinstein was listening to the Michael Jackson song Scream in his car with his brother Bob. They both liked the title for a horror movie, 20. The blob is based on a supposedly true story. On September 27, 1950, the Philadelphia Inquirer ran an article with the headline Flying Saucer Just Dissolves. The night before, police officers John Collins and Joe Keenan swore that they'd watched a mysterious object fall from the sky. Rushing towards the landing site, the men stumbled upon a purple, jelly-like mass. Collins and Keenan immediately summoned two of their colleagues, who arrived just in time to watch the material evaporate without a trace. The FBI was contacted, a press conference was held, and the whole mess became a national laughing stock. Fast forward to 1957 that year, producer Jack H. Harris was looking to make a creature feature, but he couldn't come up with a decent premise. So he asked his friend, Irvine H. Milgate, to try and devise one. It's gotta be a monster movie, explained Harris. It's gotta be in color instead of black and white. It can't be a cheapy creepy, it's gotta have some substance to it. It's gotta have characters you can believe in. And there's gotta be a unique monster, never been done before. And the method of killing the monster would have to be something that Grandma could have cooked up on her stove. Milgate remembered the Philly incident and the rest is history, 21. Joel Cohen got his first break as an assistant editor on The Evil Dead. Before becoming the Oscar-winning filmmaking duo he and his brother Ethan are today, Joel Cohen got his start as an assistant editor on The Evil Dead. Inspired by Raimi's DIY filmmaking, Joel and his brother created a pitch trailer much like Raimi's Within the Woods to raise money for their first feature, Blood Simple. While Dan Hidea stars in the final film, Bruce Campbell plays the lead in the Twa-Minute trailer, 22. Tim Burton was in contention to direct Gremlins. There was a lot of buzz surrounding Tim Burton after the success of his short film, Frank and Weenie, so much so that Steven Spielberg considered him to direct Gremlins. But the fact that Burton had yet to direct a feature film worked against him, and the gig was given to Joe Dante. A year later, Burton released his first theatrical feature, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, 23. Bob Clark's idea for a Black Christmas sequel sounds awfully familiar. A Christmas Story 1983 will be a lasting part of Bob Clark's legacy, but for horror fans, the work he did in the 1970s is just as important. Films like Children Should NT Play With Dead Things 1972 and Death Dream 1974 got him noticed, but Black Christmas 1974, one of the first slasher films, became a cult classic and earned him a dedicated following. Clark said in an interview that John Carpenter asked him if he had considered making a sequel to Black Christmas. I was through with horror, Clark explained. IDID and T come into the business to do just horror. Carpenter asked him what the sequel would be like if he did want to make one, and Clark gave him an idea that should sound very familiar to fans of the genre. I said it would be the next year and the guy would have actually been caught, escaped from a mental institution, go back to the house and they would start all over again. And I would call it Halloween, 24. Gene Hackman was slated to star in and direct The Silence of the Lambs. Gene Hackman and Orion Pictures split the $500,000 needed for the movie rights to the book. But Hackman dropped out days after he watched clips of himself at the 1989 Oscars as FBI agent Alan Parker in the violent Mississippi burning, deciding not to follow up a dark role with an even more unlikable character. 25. Child's Play was inspired by a real event. Yes, Child's Play. In 1909, Key West painter and author Robert Eugene Otto claimed that one of his family's servants placed a voodoo curse on his childhood toy, Robert the Doll. Supposedly, the doll would mysteriously move from room to room, knock furniture over, and conduct conversations with Otto. Robert the Doll was left in the attic until Otto's death in 1974, when new owners moved into his Florida home. The new family also claimed mysterious activities would happen in the house connected to the doll. Today, Robert the Doll is on display at the Custom House and Old Post Office in Key West, Florida, 26. The C-O-N-J-U-R-I-N-G-S Ed and Lorraine Warren are R-E-A-L-L-I-F-E Paranormal Investigators. The Conjuring is based on real-life paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren and their experience with the parents, a family who moved into a Rhode Island farmhouse and experienced ghostly and terrifying occurrences in 1971. When Insidious came out and was successful the story about the Warrens came to me and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is really cool, director James Wan told Entertainment Weekly in 2013.
but I did and he just want to make another ghost story or another supernatural film. One thing I had never explored was the chance to tell a story that's based on real-life characters, real-life people. So those were the things that led me to The Conjuring. The Warrens also had a possessed Raggedy Ann doll that was the inspiration for the spin-off film Annabelle. Allegedly, a demon spirit possessed the Raggedy Ann doll, which is currently on display and under lock and key at the Warrens Occult Museum in Monroe, Connecticut, 27. Damien originally had a different name in The Omen. Screenwriter David Seltzer planned to name his Antichrist Domlin after the total obnoxious Brett child of a friend, until his wife convinced him that it would be a horrible thing to do to the kid. Not to mention friendship ending, he landed on Damien after Father Damien, who started the first leper colony in the Hawaiian Islands, 28. The creature from the Black Lagoon was modeled after the Oscar statuette. Universal managed to snag a new oncoming filmmaker with a prestigious resume to direct creature from the Black Lagoon Jack Arnold, whose documentary With These Hands had received an Academy Award nomination. Though he did and get the Oscar, Arnold kept the souvenir certificate that the Academy always mailed to its nominees. The little card would go on to become an unexpected source of inspiration behind the scenes of Creature from the Black Lagoon. As Arnold told Cinefantastic magazine in 1975, there was a picture of the Oscar statuette on it. I said, if we put a gilt head on the figurine, plus fins and scales, that would look pretty much like the kind of creature we're trying to get. So they made a mold out of rubber, and gradually the costume took shape. At first, the creature had what leading Lady Julia Adams credited as Julia Adams described as an eel-like physique. Slick and streamlined, the outfit did and come with much in the way of fins, ridges, or body armor. These were, later enhanced to give the monster a more menacing appearance, 29. Bruce Campbell made $93,000 for Army of Darkness. To illustrate the plight of the working stiff actor, Bruce Campbell once provided a helpful breakdown of his salary for 1992's second Evil Dead sequel, Army of Darkness. With a $500,000 salary nipped at by agents, managers, income taxes, and a no ex-wife, he figured he made roughly $93,000. But the film took two years to complete, meaning his net profit for portraying horror icon Ash in a major motion picture was less than $50,000 a year, 30. An actual witch was hired to help make the craft more authentic. To make sure that the depiction of Wicca in the craft was as close to real life as it could be, the filmmakers hired Pat Devon as a consultant. Devon is a member of one of the largest and oldest Wiccan religious organizations in United States, Covenant of the Goddess, and at the time she was the first officer of the group Southern California Local Council. Devon played a big role in the production process and at times worked directly with the actresses. A lot of my suggestions were acted upon and virtually all of my suggestions were given careful consideration, Devon shared, even if they did and all end up in the final version of the film, 31. The name of the demon in The Exorcist is Pazuzu. Though it's never stated in the film, the demon that takes possession of Regan McNeil has a name Pazuzu, which is taken from the name of the king of the demons in Assyrian and Babylonian mythology. 32. Wes Craven regretted teasing a sequel in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Craven was rather staunchly opposed to any sort of sequel tease finale, but the big boss that DB New Lines Bob Shea insisted on one. Bob wanted a hook for a sequel, Craven told Vulture. I felt that the film should end when Nancy turns her back on Freddy and his violence, that's the one thing that kills him. Bob wanted to have Freddy pick up the kids in a car and drive off, which reversed everything I was trying to say, it suddenly presented Freddy as triumphant. I came up with a compromise, which was to have the kids get in the convertible, and when the roof comes down, we'd have Freddy's red and green stripes on it. Do I regret changing the ending I do, because it's the one part of the film that I has sent to me, 33. Stanley Kubrick allegedly typed all of those all work pages in The Shining. No one is quite sure whether Kubrick typed 500 pages of all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Kubrick did and go to the prop department with this task, using his own typewriter to make the pages. It was a typewriter that had built-in memory, so it could have turned out the pages without an actual person. But the individual pages in the film contained different layouts and mistakes. Some claim that it would have been characteristic of the director to individually prepare each page. Alas, well never know, Kubrick never addressed this question before he died, 34. The ending of Psycho was spoiled months before the film's release. Despite Hitchcock's fervent and admirable attempts at keeping the project a secret, both Variety and The Hollywood Reporter published very thorough spoilers regarding the Psycho plot months before the film actually came out, 35.
Steven Spielberg thought his DVD copy of Paranormal Activity was haunted. As the urban legend goes, Spielberg, whose DreamWorks Studios was considering distributing Paranormal Activity, took a DVD of the movie home to watch but then got freaked out when the door to his bedroom locked by itself. So the whole story about how the doors to his bedroom got locked from the inside, personally I believe it, Pele told Moviefone. It's not something the marketing department just came up with before releasing the movie. Spielberg famously carried the DVD to work in a trash bag because he thought it was haunted. Despite the shock, Spielberg loved the movie and suggested a new ending that was used in the theatrical release, 36. Drew Barrymore was slated to star in Scream. Barrymore changed her mind about playing the lead five weeks before production was set to begin. Barrymore instead suggested she play Casey Becker, the teen terrorized by the killer in the opening scene, to cleverly subvert audience expectations that a star of her stature would survive the movie. Casting directors approached Alicia Witt, Brittany Murphy, and Reese Witherspoon to take over the Sidney Prescott role before eventually casting Neve Campbell, 37. James Cameron had to quash a mutiny on the set of Aliens. Aliens was shot at England's historic Pinewood Studios which provided its own unionized crew members for productions using the facilities. Some of these workers resented the 14-hour days and, having no idea what James Cameron was capable of the Terminator hadn't opened yet, thought he was in over his head. In particular, the first assistant director thought he should be directing Aliens. He mocked Cameron, called him governor, rolled his eyes at him, and got himself fired for insubordination. The new first assistant director behaved respectfully, and things were better after that, 38. Sissy Spacek was adamant that her own hand appear in Carrie's final scene. Though Brian De Palma wanted to get a stunt person for the final scene, where Sue Snell visits Carrie's grave, Spacek insisted that it needed to be her hand that was shown, which required her to be buried in the ground. I laughed about that, Spacek told NPR. I do all my own foot and hand work, and always have 39. Buffalo Bill's dance in the silence of the lambs was not in the script. But it was in the original book, and Ted Levine, the actor who played the serial killer James Gum, insisted that the scene be included because it helped explain the demented character better. 40. Jaws originally ended just like Moby Dick. The original ending in the script had the shark dying of harpoon injuries inflicted by Quentin Brody a la Moby Dick, but Spielberg thought the movie needed a crowd-pleasing finale and came up with the exploding tank as seen in the final film. The dialogue and foreshadowing of the tank were then dropped in as they shot the movie.